What are some of the weirdest crimes that actually happen? Let's find out. Starting with... Number 6. The Voices Beatrice Bijou, a Florida personal injury attorney, shocked everyone when she intentionally rammed her Kia into four people outside the Fresh Market in Stewart, Florida. Caught on security cameras, she didn't even try to slow down, claiming voices in her head urged her to end lives. It was like something out of a twisted movie. Witnesses described how the car hopped the curb, slamming them into a wall. One victim was even airlifted to the hospital. Bijou didn't stop there either. She reversed at high speed, attempting to hit another person before finally parking at the Stewart Police Department. Bijou didn't even try to deny what she did either. Instead, she straight up told the officer that her inner voices had commanded the carnage. As it turns out, she had been off some meds she was prescribed for quite some time and was playing a dangerous game with her bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Despite pleading not guilty, the evidence was stacked against her. The court didn't buy her story, and neither did the Florida Bar, who promptly disbarred her. But here's the kicker. Despite facing serious charges, Bijou managed to wriggle out of the whole mess by pleading insanity. The court found her mentally unfit to stand trial and shipped her off to a facility run by the Department of Children and Families. This wasn't some one-time slip-up either. As it turns out, Bijou had a history with her mental health. She had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia back in 2019. There's nothing funny about mental disorders, and while meds help, sadly they're not a cure. And when people unexpectedly discontinue their meds, they often get tragic results. Although she was found not guilty by reason of insanity, it doesn't mean she just gets to walk away. She's going to be institutionalized for a long time until she's no longer considered a threat to society. Given her history, that could be a long time. Number 5. The Rat Scam UK couple Debbie and Ronnie Williams got hit with a crazy scam that'll make you scratch your head and hide your cheese. One evening, Debbie comes home from work to find a bunch of dead rats on her doorstep. Then, a lady shows up, claiming to be from the Environment Agency and talking about a rat invasion. Of course, Debbie was a bit freaked out by the situation, so she gave the woman her number, and a short while later, a guy calls her and tells her that there's definitely a rat problem and that she should check her backyard, where she found more rats. Then the guy, in a classic scam, Camera move swoops in for the rescue, saying he'll take care of that rat problem and clean up the mess for half the price of a professional contractor. Luckily, Debbie realized it was a scam and dealt with the manufactured problem on her own. Ronnie, being a local member of the city council, wasn't about to let this slide. He sounded the alarm, warning folks about these lowlifes trying to pull a fast one. And guess what? The police confirmed that it was a full-blown scam and that they had caught the rat dumpers. Now, the police are urging everyone to stay sharp and report any rat related stuff and good for debbie for not falling for it right we probably would have fallen for it and then signed up for whatever subscription service they were offering isn't leaving rats on the doorstep a mafia thing too maybe debbie and ronnie were talking a little bit too much they're lucky they didn't find any fish wrapped in newspaper instead number four the wing heist Paul and Joshua Rojek of Syracuse, New York, decided to team up and go full throttle on a wild chicken wing heist, swiping a whopping $41,000 worth of those tasty wings from the restaurant they both worked at. Imagine, father-son bonding time turned into a full-blown crime spree. Paul, at 56, and Joshua, at 33, were working as cooks at Twin Trees 2 restaurant. So, what was their slick move to get that many wings? Ordering the wings from the restaurant supplier, but then conveniently misplacing the receipts. Then they allegedly flipped those wings, selling them off at a discount to other restaurants or even straight up out of the back of a truck. Yeah, you heard that right. People from other restaurants were buying wings from the back of a pickup truck, which sounds about as safe as the free candy you get from vans. Now, you might think they could have just devoured all those wings themselves, but let's be real. That's a lot of wings for two guys. These two got caught, probably, 
generally because, let's face it, trying to offload that many wings under the radar is like trying to sneak a herd of elephants through a nursery full of sleeping babies. So fast forward to the consequences. Paul got a solid one to three years in the clink, while Joshua lucked out with five years of probation and only 60 days of weekends behind bars. Why the lighter sentence for the son? Well, apparently the old man was the mastermind behind the operation. But hey, they weren't off the hook yet. The judge ordered them both to cough up the entire $41,000 to the restaurant and its insurance company. Number three, cooked up records. Jeanette Breen from Long Island, New York, got herself into a real mess by cooking up some fake immunization records for roughly 1,500 kids who visited her at Baldwin Midwifery. Instead of giving them the real deal vaccines that she was supposed to do, she handed out some homeopathic pellets like they were candy at a parade. This lady was slapped with a hefty fine of $300,000 for messing with the state's immunization registry law and putting a lot of people at risk. What's even crazier was that she doled out over 12,000 phony immunizations during a stretch from July 2020 to December 2022, time when public health was on everyone's mind. The health department honchos weren't having any of it. Dr. James McDonald, the state health commissioner, rightly pointed out that messing with vaccine records is playing with folks' lives. This wasn't some one-off thing either. Breen had been playing fast and loose with shot records for a while. Back in 2017, she tried to swing an exemption for for a patient who needed a flu shot for work. She barely even knew the person, but apparently she has some sort of agenda. Breen has already coughed up $150,000 of the current $300,000 she owes for her more recent crime. She was put out on probation, and if she keeps her nose clean, she might dodge the other half. However, she can't ever give vaccines again or peek at the state's immunization records again. Her lawyer's spinning it like she's some kind of hero, though, saying that she's been a great midwife and is at the end of her career ready to move on with her life and as far as she was concerned the matter is done and over with no matter where someone falls on the vaccine issue what's wrong is simply taking other people's lives into their own hands and choosing for them did breen get her medical certification from dr jenny mccarthy or something as a psa don't take medical advice from dr jenny mccarthy number two the worst outcome a Taiwanese man known only as Chang tried to pull off an insurance scam claiming he lost both legs in a frostbite accident in order to pocket over a million dollars. But it was all a big fat lie. Chang cooked up this scheme with his buddy Lao who strapped him into a chair and dunked his legs in dry ice and then, yeah, cut them off. The sad thing is that he did this for some quick cash because apparently Chang owed some serious money to some serious people. So Chang goes ahead and applies for insurance payouts from not one, not two, but eight different policies, totaling over a million dollars. He even got a measly seven grand from one company before they figured out that something wasn't quite right. But the whole thing really fell apart when the insurance companies noticed that Chang bought those policies suspiciously close to his accident. So insurance investigators dug a little deeper and found out that the temperatures on the night of his supposed scooter crash, the accident he claimed to have, weren't weren't even cold enough for frostbite. Plus, his injuries were way too symmetrical, which is a red flag in the world of frostbite. It's like they say, the devil's in the details. Long story short, Chang and his partner in crime Lao were caught. They faced charges for fraud and attempted fraud. And even though it was a clearly dumb thing to do, and obviously not well thought out, Chang was probably pressured into doing it and not thinking clearly. So we can't be too hard on this guy. He's already lost both his legs. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here for our past release to find out how this guy robbed a bank and then handed the cash right back to the same teller and asked her to deposit the money into his account. Number one, the note. Las Vegas resident Gino Anthony Julia got himself in a truckload of trouble for the grim demise of his roommate Aaron Chavez. He's been accused of taking out his roommate in a connection to a bizarre Ponzi scheme fallout. Julian was caught after a desert mishap when his vehicle, the burned and partially buried body just 10 feet away, got stuck and he called a tow truck for help. Julian was nabbed in August of 2023 by the San Bernardino County Sheriff 
Sheriff's Department. At first, he spun a tale about his involvement, claiming he was merely a courier for some shadowy figures out of Miami, ferrying duffel bags for cash. But things took a macabre turn when he claimed he discovered a random body wrapped up in his Mercedes with a note telling him to, quote, take care of it, like he's a character in GTA or something. His job, as he saw it, was to dispose of the body in the California desert, a task he undertook with a peculiar blend of incompetence and diligence, dousing the body in gasoline and setting it on fire. But Julian's story unraveled with revelations about Chavez's dodgy dealings. Chavez had raked in cash through Ponzi schemes, essentially playing financial hot potato with investors' money. Two guys duped by Chavez into investing $25,000 in protein cookies grew suspicious as Chavez fed them lies while flaunting a lavish lifestyle on social media in a classic case of living large on ill-gotten gains. Then came the evidence of Julian's and Chavez's fractious relationship, spilling into physical altercations and ominous texts, hinting at a very unhappy ending. Julian's digital footprints included videos of him hitting Chavez and chillingly getting rid of his body. Texts found on Julian's phone also hinted at a need to deep clean their apartment, a nod to their grim activities. What sealed Julian's fate, though, was the tow truck's driver's discovery. His alert to authorities led to Julian's arrest, with his initial fibs to officers quickly falling apart under scrutiny. Chavez's passing was determined to be blunt force trauma to the head, with a scene straight out of a crime drama found at Julian's apartment, blood stains and all. As Julian awaits trial, his tales of being an unwitting part participant in Chavez's demise hang in the air. Julian remains a prime suspect with the legal principle of innocence until proven guilty hanging over the proceedings, but the court of public opinion might not be so impartial. And when Julian called the tow truck driver, why did he leave the evidence of a crime out in plain sight? Dude, bury it first at least, and maybe further than 10 feet from the road. It's like he wasn't even trying because he thought the tow truck driver was going to see the body and just be cool with it. Who are some of the dumbest criminals out there? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, let's bring him back. A wealthy Florida man fell victim to a daring robbery orchestrated by two women he had brought back to his Broward County townhouse. The unidentified man's choice to invite the two women he met at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino back to his house probably wasn't his best decision. The women ended up stealing his shoes, his gun, and his diamond-encrusted Rolex. Two of these things he probably should have kept a much better eye on. The prize of the heist was no doubt the Rolex, which was worth about $25,000. This intricately designed timepiece held not only a significant monetary value, but was also a great way for the guy to show off that he has a lot of money. It makes you wonder if the watch is what attracted the attention of the women who chose to rob him. There's a bunch of clear footage from the casino on the man meeting these two elegant ladies at the bar around 3 a.m. He'd exchanged numbers with one of them and then ended up meeting with them again about an hour later. So now it's 4 a.m. and he decides to take these two complete strangers back to his place to attempt to have a nice time. He probably was going to play board games or something. So they get back to his place and he falls asleep. The women were probably all disappointed they couldn't show off their monopoly skills, so they decided to steal his stuff instead. When the guy woke up the next morning, his watch, shoes, firearm, and his platinum Amex had been taken. And sadly, the two refined ladies were nowhere to be seen. So the guy texted whichever one of them he called before, asking for them to just return his stuff. He was ignored because, of course he was. He picked up two chicks in a casino bar at 3 a.m., and nothing good ever happens after 3 a.m. But, for some reason, he waits until 5 p.m. that night to file a police report. He probably didn't want to call the cops because he was hoping true love would prevail. It did not. So, now police have loads of footage of these two queens, along with one of their cell numbers, and they have his credit card that if they use, he will know where they are. No doubt those women shouldn't have done what they did, and they were stupid for stealing from this guy since they were on camera and he has their cell number. But really, when you meet two women in a bar at 3 a.m. and you bring them back to your place and then go to sleep, you're kind of asking to be ripped off. Who's at fault here? Let us know in the comments below. Number five, just my account, please. McRoberts Williams, whose first sounds like his last name and probably confused all of his teachers, found himself in police custody following a bank 
robbery. Williams targeted a Wells Fargo bank in Wilmington, Delaware, where he approached a young teller, handed her a note demanding $150, and explained it was a robbery. As the new hundredaire fled the bank on foot, he began to wonder where he should stash his stack of bills. He didn't want anyone to steal it, so he stopped at a nearby ATM and deposited the stolen money right into his own bank account. Williams' behavior may seem like there's some underlying issues, but he later disclosed to the police that his mind was actually being controlled by an external force through an implant in his body. Such statements obviously point towards some mental health struggles that might have contributed to his actions. During the robbery, Williams apologized to the bank teller after handing her the robbery note. As he walked out a little bit richer, she triggered the silent alarm. The police quickly arrived, and the chase ended with Williams hiding behind a nearby shopping center where local troopers eventually located and apprehended him. Despite not immediately recovering the stolen money, police did find a Wells Fargo bank card in Williams' possession. McRoberts Williams was charged with second-degree robbery, and his arrest came with a $6,000 cash bond. The teller must have been so confused when Williams was demanding such a small amount. She was probably like, are you sure you don't want more? That's it? Usually robbers ask for all of the money. Then she goes into autopilot. Uh, how did you want that? Large bills? Uh, thank you for choosing Wells Fargo. Number four, Fire Festival of Pizza. Ishmael Osaker, the mastermind behind what has been dubbed the Fire Festival of Pizza, referencing the infamous Fire Festival scandal, Osaker essentially planned a whole pizza party and ended up ripping a bunch of people off in the process. Promising an extravagant celebration of pizza, a truly noble food worthy of its own festival, the idea held an enticing appeal for pizza enthusiasts, which is basically everyone. The festival promised a delectable array of dough, cheese, and toppings, but the actual experience ended up being far from what was promised. Attendees who had eagerly purchased tickets, with prices soaring as high as $75, were disappointed when they were handed tiny little slivers of pizza. You know, the ones we're talking about too, because there's always that one last piece in the box that no one wants and gets all stale really fast. It's usually given to the youngest child who won't care or the least popular person in the room. Not only were the pizza slices way too small, but apparently they tasted awful as well. The mismatch between what was advertised and what was delivered made a whole lot of pizza partiers very unhappy. The festival itself was also plagued by an air of inadequacy. Empty tents and a lack of vendors contributed to a sense of hollowness that permeated the gathering. Adding further fuel to the fire, Osaker's team resorted to posting excuses on Facebook, blaming pizza delivery delays for the pathetic offerings, and even suggested a makeup sampling to placate the disgruntled attendees. The New York City Pizza Festival wasn't Osaker's first venture into organizing scam festivals either. A similar pattern had unfolded with his African Food Festival the previous year, where attendees were shortchanged as the event grossly underdelivered what was promised. And to make the pizza festival an even bigger disaster, Osaka had also scheduled a simultaneous hamburger festival dubbed Burgerfest, honoring the second most noble food in the exact same place. It's like Osaka was like, well, this first food festival crashed and burned, so how can I do worse the second time? Oh, I know, I'll put on two of them. As the day went on and more and more people were furious, Hangry Garden, the event curation company, became a focal point of blame. Hangry Garden was accused of causing delays and being responsible for the festival shortcomings. However, Hangry Garden's co-founder, Jeremy S. Gary, wasn't about to take the fall. He was quick to clarify that their withdrawal from the event was because of Osaka's failure to uphold his end of the deal and his misleading them about the event's logistics. The event was such an outrageous catastrophe that the New York Attorney General's office launched an investigation into Osaka's activities. Once he learned he was being investigated, Osaka begrudgingly offered refunds to the attendees. But despite the mounting evidence of his wrongdoing, Osaka still complained about negative press coverage and attempted to shift blame onto others like he's a victim. He said that certain newspapers reported without facts, quotes, or context. Osaka was eventually issued a court order banning him from organizing events in New York and was required to pay $311 $1,398 in restitution and penalties with 111198 bucks designated for duped customers and $150,000 for the state. The only way that pizza festival could have been worse is if all they had was pineapple pizza. Pineapples have no business on pizza. Shout out if you agree. Number three, Principled Embezzler. 
Nia Wilson, a former principal of New Mission High School in Boston, misappropriated school funds for her personal gain. She faced charges for wire fraud, revealing an elaborate scheme that saw her misusing nearly $40,000 to fund her own extravagant, all-inclusive vacations, including two trips to Barbados. Wilson's fraudulent activities spanned from 2006 to 2019, allowing her to rip off the school for nearly 13 years. During this time, she requested checks from the the school's external fiscal agent account under the names of other people. These checks were then endorsed by Wilson herself after being deposited into her personal bank account. This practice allowed her to siphon off school funds without arousing suspicion. The former principal used her ill-gotten gains to finance two vacations to Barbados. But what makes her scheme a little worse is that she even had funds dispersed for her friends who came with her on these trips. Wilson's actions aren't only ethically questionable, but also unwise, given the paper trail that was left behind. She may have been able to avoid detection, but the minute someone noticed, it was game over. Her financial maneuverings and the apparent mismanagement of school funds eventually raised the red flags that ultimately led to her arrest and subsequent charges. Wilson pled guilty to her crimes and has agreed to pay restitution. At the time of this video, she also faces a maximum prison sentence of 20 years for wire fraud, along with up to three years of supervised release and a fine of up to $250. $50,000. And Saturday School. Number two, scamming the IRS while being supervised by the IRS. Matthew Meredith, a resident of St. Petersburg, got himself sentenced to six years in prison for orchestrating a scheme that saw him amass a substantial fortune through false tax claims, which he then used to live an extravagant lifestyle. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Tampa said that in the span of six months, Meredith submitted five fake tax claims, seeking refunds totally totaling more than $170 million. Meredith's ruse first bore fruit when the IRS issued him a refund check worth $6,374,576.92 based on his fictitious claims. Meredith's newfound wealth let him buy not just one, but six Mercedes Benzes totaling $843,269. And he didn't stop there, because why be low key when you're stealing from the government? Meredith next purchased a sprawling mansion with 6,500 square feet of waterfront opulence located in St. Petersburg. He paid cash for this upscale residence, which amounted to $2.6 million. What makes Meredith's scheme even more audacious is that he did this while under federal supervision following a conviction on contraband-related charges. His criminal history didn't stop him from scamming, which started up nearly four years from the time of his release. With a mountain of evidence and a growing trail of extravagant purchases, Meredith pleaded guilty to theft of government property and money laundering, earning him six years behind bars. Why Meredith, with no legitimate proof of income, would choose to invest in real estate with cash makes almost no sense, as if it's not going to attract attention. The IRS was going to eventually catch the error, so he probably should have just hid the money, said he lost it all gambling and done some time. Not that we've uh, thought about such things. We're just saying. Number one, a hole in one. Brenton Fillers, also known as the TikTok trickster, got himself arrested for theft and fraud charges across multiple states. Fillers allegedly swindled women out of money and possessions through a calculated scheme that relied on his charm and deceit. Fillers MO involved connecting with women on TikTok, building relationships with them by showering attention and affection, and then making requests for money and other favors. Once he gained their trust, he would abruptly vanish, leaving his victims in emotional, financial distress. Fillers had been operating this con for quite some time, with a criminal history spanning over three decades. One of his victims, a woman known only as Trisha, shared her experience. She first encountered Fillers on TikTok, where he went by the alias Jason Mitchell. After connecting, he managed to manipulate her emotions and eventually convinced her to pick him up from the airport in Mobile, Alabama. He was already with another woman driving to Texas after she had loaned him $1,000 to help deal with some supposed issues with the IRS. Somehow, he he ended up leaving the woman, stealing all of her cash and credit cards in the process, and getting in contact with Trisha, asking her to pick him up at the airport. After spending a few days with Trisha, he said he was going to take her car to the shop for her, and never came back. 
Fillers' vanity became his downfall. He was posting pictures of himself proudly displaying trophies from golf tournaments in Texas that attracted attention from law enforcement. Chief John Barber of the Spanish Fort Police Department explained that it was these photographs that allowed them to arrest him. Authorities were able to track him down at the University of Kentucky Hospital where he was seeking treatment, calling one of his victims and telling her the name of his doctor. Police confirmed his identity from the golf pictures, his location from the victim, and kaboom, he was arrested. Fillers now faces charges in multiple states, including theft of property in Alabama, felony fraud use of a credit card in Arkansas, and theft of a motor vehicle in Tennessee. His victims and the public are reminded dangers lurking in the world of social media. Brandon, if you're running scams, you probably shouldn't be proudly posting pictures of yourself all over the place winning golf tournaments, or just being a generally terrible person. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather do. Live in today's culture now or live in a different time period's culture such as the culture in 1920.